I think we're going to see a uh, clip before we start. Is that right? And uh, appreciate everybody coming. And uh, I know we're in, uh, we're still in, in the midst of uh, COVID, but uh, we got a lot of uh, space up here so that uh, you don't have to sit as far back as you, as you are. You can, you can feel free. I think we have a testing protocol here that everybody who came had to be, uh, it shows uh, vaccined and boosted, you know, so I think we're among, uh, I don't think we have any MAGA folks in here, <laughs> but you never know though. Okay, so the clip has been played and um, so I want to welcome you to this panel. Uh, when Mundir Jones and I introduced the Judiciary Act of 2021, it was seen as too radical, too political, uh, just not uh, the thing to do, radical. Uh, but I think as time has passed since we introduced it, uh, more people have been convinced that um, uh, unpacking the court by expanding it is the way to go. And so that's what this panel is going to be all about today. I know that uh, with you all being here, it means that you feel that that is uh, something that is of interest to you and many of you support that idea. We appreciate your support. And when you um, return to your homes uh, and to your districts, uh, we need you to be active about this and, and speak about it and get with your representatives and senators and let them know that um, there's something that can be done to save freedom and democracy, not just for, uh, for white males, but for everyone in this country. And indeed, there can be no democracy if it doesn't apply to everyone. So with that, I want to um, turn this um, uh, podium over to my uh, cohort uh, and colleague, uh, uh, Mondaire Jones the Great from New York. Well, well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the distinguished chair of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Courts, who's been an incredible leader on this subject, not just court expansion, but other forms of court reform. And of course, odds are, if you're here today, you probably already support 
some kind of court reform because you, uh, like everyone else in this room, uh, is cognizant of many of the crises that we face today. And as I think about them, I think chief among them is a crisis of democracy. I don't think we live right now with what has happened to the Voting Rights Act and what's continuing to happen and what will happen in a true multiracial democracy. And the Supreme Court has been an accomplice in creating this crisis. Uh, it is a court that has also unraveled other fundamental rights. We saw that recently uh, when it ended a 50-year constitutional right to an abortion uh, and so much else. Uh, over the last decade, the far-right majority on the court has gutted the Voting Rights Act, unleashed unlimited corporate spending in our elections, as I mentioned, ended the constitutional right to an abortion, struck down common sense efforts to end gun violence, and also curbed the EPA's ability to address climate change. So much of this happened over the summer, by the way. I know the Dobbs decision ending the right to an abortion got most of the attention, but there were a lot of other really bad decisions that week and in the week that followed. The MAGA majority on the Supreme Court is an extension of the Republican Party, which will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to hold on to power and to impose its unpopular policies on the American people. That is done through this unaccountable institution called the Supreme Court because at the ballot box, absent voter suppression, my Republican colleagues and their allies could never win on the merits of their deeply unpopular policy ideas. And they won't stop at voting rights. They won't stop at the environment or our need to address gun violence or the climate crisis. Justice Thomas told us that marriage equality, intimacy, and, and even contraception are all within the sights of this far-right, 6-3, hyper-partisan majority. To those who argue that if we expand the court, Republicans may do the same in the future, I would invite them to understand that that nightmare scenario is already upon us. As Chairman Johnson said, court expansion is about unpacking the court. This court is already packed. They don't need any additional partisan hacks in the majority to accomplish whatever they want. And not even Justice Roberts has control over this majority anymore. He's no longer the swing vote. Court expansion is not a novel idea. Congress has changed the size of the court seven times before in our nation's history. After Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson became president, Congress was wary that this new president who opposed Reconstruction era laws would nominate justices to the Supreme Court who were hostile to civil rights. And so Congress literally reduced the size of the Supreme Court over time to deprive him of the opportunity to nominate justices in that mold. I think that Congress today, Democrats in particular, have to act with that kind of boldness and urgency. And so I think court expansion is a, not, is a modest proposal given everything that we are facing. A poll came out last week showing that a majority of Americans now support court expansion. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that because that was not always the case, <laughs> but that is what movement building can do. And, and of course, it has long been established, or at least over the past year it's been established, that the vast majority of Democrats support court expansion. Uh, my own view is that Congress has to act now before it is too late, while we have majorities in both chambers uh, to protect and to strengthen what remains of our democracy and what remains of the fundamental rights that we just take for granted in our everyday lives. So long as this court remains hostile to civil rights, uh, such as by gutting the Voting Rights Act, for example, uh, rights that have often been enacted by Congress, duly enacted by Congress, court expansion has to be part of the response. We cannot expect to simply legislate civil rights and think that this court is going to uphold those rights when statutes are challenged before it. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to be talking about what is required to preserve Justice Thurgood Marshall's legacy. And I'm really, really excited, most of all, 
uh, by all of you in this room. I mean, this is, this is great interest. And of course, by the incredible Simone Sanders, who's a, a dear friend and, and just an inspiration, I think, to all of us. And I want to congratulate her on her new show on MSNBC. Um, as well as panelists who I've also long admired. So with that said, I'd love to introduce the great Simone Sanders, who's going to moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Y'all give it up for the good congressman. And give it up for Congressman Hank Johnson as well. My name is Simone Sanders Towns, and I'm so happy to be your moderator today. I'm going to get up on this stage, but first I'm going to get the panelists up here. You all are not fired up enough about the Supreme Court and what is happening to our rights. So hopefully this panel will inject a little life into y'all out here. Okay, somebody say rights. rights. Somebody say Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Now, I am not a lawyer, okay? I just used to do the talking points for them. So I'm going to bring up some people to give context, history, uh, and to really break down what's happening in this moment. First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Tamara Brummer. She is the Senior Advisor and Director of National Outreach for We Demand Justice. Keep it going. Next, I would like to bring Mr. Donald Sherman to the stage. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Counsel for CREW, C-R-E-W. Give it up for Mr. Sherman. Next up. You have seen him, Mr. Ellie Mastall, ladies and gentlemen. He's a justice correspondent for the nation. Come on, Ellie, to the stage. Not to be outdone is Mr. Roland Martin, host of the Roland Milter, Roland, Roland Martin Unfiltered show. And last but certainly not least is Martin Luther King Jr., the third of the Drum Major Institute. Give it up for this panel. All right, I'm going to leave this mic and come join the panel. Y'all can do better than that. So I'm going to start this conversation laying a little context, right? We talk about the legacy of uh, Thurgood Marshall, the first black justice who served on the United States Supreme Court today. This morning... Judge, now Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, was invested, it was an investiture, that's what the event is called, into the Supreme Court because we have a session that starts on Monday. So while we are excited and happy about that history that is being made, um, I think it's important to unpack what is on the docket upcoming. You know, on Monday, the court is going to hear uh, all kinds of things. They're starting early. They're starting at 930. The court is going to issue a long list of cases um, that it is agreeing to hear. One of the things to watch this Supreme Court session is particularly about a challenge to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So, uh, Ellie, you are the justice correspondent. I want to start with you by just, because I think we need a baseline for this conversation. What is going on with this court? And what is the, if you had to pick one thing you are most concerned about this session, what would it be? Oh, I can't pick one. Everything well, you got to pick one, one now. You got to um, pick one. Right, all right. Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll start with democracy. That seems like a good place to <laughs> place to start. Um, the court is going to hear two major cases that will determine whether or not we have a republic this term. The the one that most has gotten most of the press is called it is a case called Moore v. Harper. Harper. This is the independent state legislature theory. This is the theory that the state legislatures, not the voters not the courts of the state, but the state legislatures of the state actually get to decide the voting rules of the state, who gets to vote in the state, whose votes counts in the state, whose votes can be thrown away in the state. This theory is so um, um, controversial that the first uh, version of it was surfaced by William Rehnquist in Bush v. Gore while he was casting about trying to come up with a way to make George Bush president over a court-ordered recount in Florida. I'm gating myself a bit. Um, but over that recount, William Rehnquist uh, uh, surfaced this independent state legislature theory. It was widely debunked at the time, except for one other justice, Clarence Thomas, who was a fan of this theory. And so that is going to be coming up um, this term, whether or not the, in the legislatures themselves can throw out um, votes that essentially they don't like. The other big case 
is going to happen on Tuesday. This is called Merrill, um, this, I forget, it's Midges v. Merrill, or I'm forgetting the first part of the name. Doesn't matter. This is about the Alabama gerrymandered mm-hmm. map. Um, Alabama put forward a map that was, how only had one majority, minor, uh, majority minority district, probably should have had two majority minority districts. Um, it was so racially um, um, divisive that even the conservative Alabama state court was like, that's, that's too racist for us. Um, and this is a court in Alabama. It goes up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, a Trump court, and the 11th Circuit, two judges picked by Trump who were just like, yeah, no, dude, that's really racist. You can't do that. And Brett Kavanaugh says, wait, 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 nope, nope, not too racist for me. And so in January of last year, long, long, sorry, of this year, long before the election, Brett Kavanaugh and his band of conservative cronies say that we're too close to the election to change Alabama's maps, so we have to go with the racist maps for this, for this election. That's what's happening in November. And then on, in October, we will decide whether or not long term this map is too racist. Um, what that's going to be is, a, as Simone was saying, a direct challenge to Section 2 of the Voting Rights mm-hmm. Act, which should outlaw this, these kinds of things. So if I had to pick one thing, it's the Supreme Court overturning the will of Democratic voters in this country. Democracy. All right. Straightforward. So... Donald and Tamara, I want to bring you both in. Tamara's with We Demand Justice. Donald, you're with Crew. Uh, both of you, I think your organizations, you know, your organization operates as a watchdog organization. Um, Tamara, I think the reason that expanding the court, uh, has become such a mainstream conversation, I think it's largely due in, to the work of We Demand Justice. And I think, you know, I, I, I worked on the president's campaign. I can I, I know the conversations that we're having, so I say that with confidence. Talk to me a little bit about the advocacy efforts around the court, and then we're going to go to our, our, our political experts right here to get into it, to my, to my right and to my left. But talk to me a little bit about your advocacy efforts around the conversation around the court, because for one political party in this country, the courts have been a voting issue. You know, my, my, my friends who are Republican strategists, that has been an issue that they have organized around. It has not been a mainstream conversation for all voters and, and, and particularly Democratic voters. So talk a little bit about that. Tamara, I'm going to start with you. Then, Donald, I want you to jump in. Thank you for that question. You know, demand justice started in 2018 because Democrats weren't doing anything about the courts. We had watched Merrick Garland sit and wither, right? The first black president put up had a Supreme Court nominee and the Republicans changed the rules so that they could get the Supreme Court justice that they wanted. And then they keep changing the rules. When you talk to everyday people, our communities understand the impact that the Supreme Court has on our lives. But our, our members of Congress, not all of them, but many of them, act as if, well, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the courts. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. If you vote for me, we'll pass a law. I'm going to pass a law. It's going to change everything. The Supreme Court has shown us over and over again that they don't care about their laws. They don't care about any of your laws. What they care about is controlling power, right? And so for us, when we talk to everyday people about the courts, we're saying you have, when you vote, your vote has so much power. That means that when you vote for the right candidate, they're going to have the opportunity to not just put Supreme Court justices on the bench, they're going to put federal lower court justices on the bench. That's where most of us have, have our day in court right, in the circuit court, in the district court. We have to have a pipeline of the right kind of justices to make that happen. So when out, the best example of this is when I, when when RBG passed away, I was, you know, going around in D.C., everybody asked you, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I said, I work on the courts. And it was black folks. They were like, oh, we got to add seats to the Supreme Court. And I said, well, why? Why we got to add seats? It's easy. It's broken. People understand it's a game. And when the rules aren't working, the Republicans changed the rules to make them work for them. We have power now, at least I think we have power, and we have an opportunity to make the, the playing field more even um, for our communities and for our people. And that's why I think we're seeing in the course of two years that the majority of Americans now want to see court expansion as a real viable option to making our democracy more robust. So, and Donald, jump in here. You know, Tamara, I think, uh, and I, I know Roland Martin is going to have something to say in just a moment, because I think a lot of people, to hear you say people understand the importance of the courts. 
Uh, I, I think that there are folks out there, analysts and strategists, who would say, mm, I don't necessarily think they do. So we're going to circle back on that point. Donald. Yeah, uh, so thank you for the question. And I think when we're talking about advocacy for the Supreme Court, right, like there's advocacy that people think of, Thurgood Marshall in front of the bench arguing. Um, but then my group, uh, which is an ethics and good government group, we're focused on the advocacy that you don't see, right? The money that is spent on junkets, on speaking engagements, on conferences for the justices to come hang out, huddle with the cabal that Ellie mentioned, um, and have rich folks, rich conservatives come and press the flesh with Supreme Court justices. And one of the reasons why we're talking about Clarence Thomas specifically is because, um, you know, whereas there are a number of justices whose spouses have stepped back from uh, advocacy, from litigation, when they saw their spouse rise to the federal bench. What we've seen with Clarence and Jenny Thomas is, is that she is affirmatively engaged in an effort to monetize her position and her proximity to Clarence Thomas. And this manifests in things like Clarence Thomas forgetting to mention that his wife got $680,000 from the Heritage Foundation, because obviously the Heritage Foundation has no business that could be relevant to the Supreme Court. There are any number of ways that, um, you know, you think that you're going to go and have your day in court. But what happens when you show up and the decision has already been made before you walk into the room, before your advocate walks into the room? And so from, uh, from the standpoint of an ethics advocate, we're focused on what's happening behind those closed doors. How do we bring sunlight to what the Supreme Court is doing? And, you know, as Chairman Johnson and Representative Jones um, mentioned at their hearing in April, the Supreme Court doesn't even have a code of conduct. I was just going to jump in and note that. There is no um, oversight, if you will, for members, justices on the Supreme Court. There is actually no enforcement. If there was oversight, what is the enforcement mechanism? Exactly. It does not exist. You hold tight, because you're going to kick us off for the lightning round. <laughs> Mr. King. It strikes me that whether we are talking about, uh, I mean, the, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I think, I mean, the reality is, is that the Voting Rights Act is on life support, and if Section 2, which is eliminated, it will be dead. And one, I don't think we're talking enough about that, but two, I think the reality is that a lot of the conversations that we are having around the court now, a lot of the things uh, and, and issues that are bubbling up to the Supreme Court, they, th these, are, these are things that are not new. History is unbroken continuity, as a mentor once said to me. So give me a little historical context here. How do, as, the, as a child of the Civil Rights Movement, you see what is happening right now, and I have to imagine that this weighs on uh, you and your colleagues heavily. There's, first of all, there's no question. Let me also thank Congressman Johnson and Jones for having all of us, and it's an honor to be on this panel with everyone, and especially you. Thank you. Madam Moderator. Uh, it, this, this, the tragedy is, unfortunately, you have to provide leadership at times. People know what's happening in our communities. But you also have to pro provide context, as you've said. And the fact of the matter is the court is out of line with what the majority of the people think. Therefore, and, it's, and secondly, the court used to be aligned with the um, appellate courts. I think there were nine. So that's at some point why there was rational for nine justices. Now there are 13. Therefore, we need to add four more justices, and it needs to be done now. Uh, I don't think we, and, 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 and every now and then you, got, you have to slap people upside the head, nonviolently, <laughs> slap them upside the head. Uh, because they don't realize, oh, this is what you mean. We don't need that moment. We need to be pushing for this legislation right now so that we have a court that at least 
more swings in line to what the majority wants. We purport to be a democracy. And as Ali said, democracy is fading. And I, it, the most recent polling also said that that was one of the top issues. Thank God, finally. Yes, for the first time. Finally. You know, in addition to inflation and other things that are very important also. But we don't have but a few minutes to get this right. You know, um, I was involved with a large coalition in August 28th of last year uh, to get voting rights done. We didn't succeed there. Then in January of last year, we were involved with another large campaign to try to get voting rights done. So we got 48 senators. We were almost there, but it's not enough. So the fact of the matter is the filibuster was addressed. And we almost got there. That still has to be done, by the way, in my judgment, along with addition of members to the Supreme Court so that it is in line structured the way that it initially was because one justice is over each one of those districts and some justices have two because they are 13 as opposed to nine. It would seem like people would want to engage in logic but when you're dealing with political points and control, which is what you know, most of the Republicans seem to be about, we have a big, big problem. And until the public engages in a significant way, I mean, my dad understood that and his team and others have understood that. We have to stay on the battlefield. We can't talk about we're tired. Well, everybody's tired. We have to constantly be engaged. This is one of the most critical issues mm -hmm. of our time. Mm -hmm. All right, Roland, we're on the battlefield now, my brother. And Roland is going to say something that's going to want to make everyone on this panel respond. Please do feel free to respond. We're having a conversation. <laughs> I want to, I just, I want to throw this out there, okay? I'm the moderator. I'm starting the pot today. I think a lot of Americans are at the place where they say, hey, why don't we have more, some, some people, why we should have more Supreme Court justices. And there's a segment of the population that this is not the discussion at their dinner table. And then you also have to account for the current president of the United States and his advisors who are not for expansion of the court. Roland. You asked earlier, are folks interested? And you said, I, you say we, we are, we are focused on this. If you walk out that door and go to the other end of this hallway, you are going to see a throng of people standing outside of the two sessions further down. One of them is called hip hop and politics. The other is about entertainment. Do you see standing room only outside this door? Black folks are laughing ourselves to death. It's very we fun. are entertaining ourselves to death. Now, Roland, are you asserting, though, that black people do not care about the Supreme Court? What, I'm, what I am asserting is when we are more interested in hearing from ill-informed celebrities who are not using their celebrity in the tradition of Paul Robeson, of Harry Belafonte, Ruby D, Harry Belafonte, Dick Gregory, Diane Carroll, Sidney Poitier, and others. So we have a movement where we have academics and legal scholars and media folks who are trying to talk about this, but we do not have all hands on deck. If this is a battlefield, mm -hmm. then we are operating shorthanded. And so there's a level of consciousness that is required to connect the dots. 2016, a young sister from North Carolina calls my radio show. She says, look, I ain't feeling Hillary. I don't like Trump. I'm just going to focus on my issues in my state. I said, where are you from? She said, North Carolina. I said, name me the four issues you're going to focus on. And she named all four. And I walked her down and showed her how the president of the United States and the United States Senate and the House has a direct relationship to the four issues in her state. 
she was somehow thinking that what happens in D.C. was completely divorced from what was happening in North Carolina. And I told her, you are absolutely out of your mind. He was a, he was a, an, a so-called informed activist. So the problem is we have to stop operating these discussions in silos and then start connecting the dots, which is why I say we got to have Schoolhouse Rock 2.0, 3.0, because folk have to understand you can't, Gavin Newsom just signed a law that you can no longer use rap lyrics in prosecution. That is a court, that will be challenged in the courts. The district attorney in Fulton County is using lyrics to prosecute RICO cases. So you, if you're an entertainer, you damn well better be understanding how the political system and the legal system is imp impacting what is being said on, I said think on the record. Mr. Uh, wants to jump in on this. Connect the dots. If we, we have to start connecting the dots better so that av an everyday person realizes Oh, that Supreme Court thing does impact me, but we have to explain it in a way, or as Joe Madison said, you got to put it where the goats can get it. Okay. Yes, but some of that is leadership, and some of that is Democratic leadership, and some of that is where Democrats have dropped the ball. You want to talk about Hillary? Let's talk about Hillary. I voted for Hillary. I think she was would have been a better president than Donald Trump. But somehow Hillary Clinton went through an entire campaign without mentioning Merrick Garland's name which is ridiculous. And you want to go back further, not to cast aspersions on his Lord and Savior, Barack Obama, but why was Merrick Garland the choice anyway, as opposed to Ketanji Brown Jackson back in 2016? When that, and Roland, I know you agree with this, when if Obama had oh, nominated... Dude, look, look, Obama's still mad at me because I <laughs> called him out for not appointing a black woman to the Supreme Court, and I still don't give a damn. Well, I don't me want President Obama to be mad at me, be mad because at I, <laughs> I, I, I have no smoke for, I I for President Obama. I got, but I let got me focus, y'all. See, this President is why Obama. they got me moderating this panel. It's a lot of, it's a lot of big people up here. Roland made some very clear assertions. Okay, so I just, I want you to respond to this. It is democratic leadership. It is entertainment. You made a point. Secretary Clinton went through an entire campaign and did not mention the name Merrick Garland. So the other issue here, and I think Roland is, is, is partially right about this, but why is there that focus? I do not believe that your average least common denominator MAGA voter is any smarter or more civically engaged than your average base black voter. I do not believe that. What I believe is that the average base MAGA voter has been told for a generation that anything they want, they have to have the courts. So your MAGA guy, he can't quote me much about how the Constitution works, but you can quote the Second Amendment. That MAGA guy might not know much about how the civics of the visit, but he knows if he doesn't like gays kissing on each other in a restaurant, he gets, he needs to have the court. Whereas if I go to an average base Democratic voter, then, then you get to the problem, you get to the problem that Roland's talking about, right? If I say like, hey, do you care about climate change? Then you need the court. Do you care about guns? Then you need the court. Do you care about abortion rights? Then everything, but we don't have leaders that do a good one-to-one -one comparison, and we haven't built that, that for over the past 30 years. How so, can I, can I just, uh, you know, I think Yes, and wh while you're answering, Donald, yeah. I want to throw this out there. Just yeah. throw it a pot. Uh, we got some leaders, right, because we are at this panel at the Congressional Black Caucus at the 51st Annual Legislative Conference having this conversation under the leadership of Chairman Johnson and Congressman Jones. But the reality is that this is, this is not a, uh, a widely accepted thought within the Democratic Party apparatus. I just noted that you, the current President of the United States of America, who is a Democrat, does not believe in expanding the court. So first of all, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the number of issues that we need to go to the mat for are substantially larger than our white brothers and sisters, right? So when you talk about uh, we don't show up for X, like we have to show up for everything. So you know, I don't want to give anybody a pass. I think education is important, but the number of issues that we have to show up for um, pales in comparison to what other folks have to show up for. Uh, I think Ellie's point is a good one, though, that every issue that we care about, we need the courts. And that message has not penetrated, in part because you know, there aren't that many people that have made it a priority. Part of that is the generation that we came up with. My parents, like for my parents, the court was revered, right? It was the clarion call. It was the thing that made the difference 
uh, in having rights or not. And frankly, I think some folks took it for granted. Um, I wonder, uh, I think the orientation is changing now that Roe is gone, but God help me, we had an insurrection, we have lost Roe v. Wade, like, I mean, what is it gonna take for institutionalists to realize that institutions can't protect us if we don't stand up and do what is necessary to rebuild them? Tamara, now is expanding the court the only way? Because one could argue that you have to have a focus on federal courts. And uh, if one of my former colleagues were sitting here and listening to this panel, they would say this president has made a focus on the federal courts, put more black women on the federal courts than any president before him, including. Who say it? <laughs> say it. You Barack know. Obama. Okay. Absolutely. Y'all got to stop being scared to criticize. Ain't nobody this. care, bro. I, I think rolling at the flamethrower. I think rolling at the flamethrower. I think that the thing is. I ain't is a flamethrower, but he, he, he felt that heat. The reality, though, is that it's, the house is on fire, and court expansion is a little bit of the water that's going to put out the fire. Okay. Right? We have to understand that Roe was the floor. That was the floor. This court keeps playing in our faces, and people are telling us, well, just wait and see. They're going to die soon. No, they don't. They don't die. Look at Mitch McConnell. We, we, so we I wanna... would like to know the chairman <laughs> nor the congressman condone that, the that, death of fine. members of Congress. That's correct. But, but here's the thing we NBC. need to think about. As the third branch of the government, there's a, this is about checks and balances. It is absolutely out of balance. We have to check it. Adding four seats provides some more balance. We also can have term limits. The fact that people can be on that court for a lifetime, and then what they do is then you'll wait. You'll wait till your person gets in office and then you'll retire. Thank you. Thank you for Justice Breyer for actually doing that, right? Some others didn't do that. We can also have a code of Ginsburg. ethics. Say it. We, this is like court expansion is just, this is like, how do we stop the bleeding? This is triage. We aren't treating it like we're not taking the court. And I agree that our leadership in this country on the Democratic Party has, tra has treated the court as if it's this, this deity of gods, that because you're not a lawyer, you can't question them, that they have, they know the Constitution better than the rest of us, and so how dare, uh, how dare we challenge them? How dare we ask questions? How dare we say, actually, this doesn't work anymore. I'm really excited that Justice Jackson is on the Supreme Court, but I'm going to tell you something. There's not enough black girl magic. There's not enough black girl magic that's going to stop this court from dismantling our democracy even more. But here's what I mean by connecting the dots, because this I don't only look at this thing in terms of federal courts. I, I spend an inordinate amount of time on my show walking our folks through this. In 2020, first of all, people are excited. Who's from North Carolina right now? Anybody in North Carolina? People in North Carolina, folks are excited that Shira Beasley is running for the United States Senate. Look at the polling. It's all I'll have her on my show one She's Saturday. up one, she's up two, it varies. But in 2020, she ran for re-election to be the Chief Justice of the North Carolina State Supreme Court had she she lost by 400 votes had she won democrats would have a six to one advantage on the north carolina state supreme court by her losing they it's now four to three now why is north carolina why do they have a democratic governor right now why do they actually have control of the courts because Obama wins North Carolina by 14,100 votes in 2008. They completely gut the election results in 2000, uh, voting, voter suppression in 2010. Uh, uh, Tom Tillis, uh, who a lot of black folks voted for in 2020, he got about 18%. He was the architect of that. And so what then happens is, then Moral Mondays, they then, we're Reverend Barber, 17 people, they begin to lead that, it goes statewide, they claw back a lot of those rights. That's what led to declaring racial gerrymandering illegal because they, they had the state Supreme Court. So when we talk about the courts, we have to also realize Republicans are also looking at state courts. The reason Biden wins Pennsylvania because you had smart justices of the Pennsylvania state Supreme Court. And what do they want to do? They tried to go to single member districts to guarantee you didn't have statewide elections because, again, we have a federally appointed Supreme Court. But many of our states, our justices are elected. So when we're talking about electoral politics, we rarely ever talk about judges who are running. So what we have to also be doing when I talk about, again, collecting the dots and walking people through, educating our people to understand you can't just yell, expand the courts if you won't even vote for who's in your state. 
And so the state courts matter, and that's also where Democrats have not paid much attention. Now they're trying to throw resources. Democrats could right now take control of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. And to. if they take control of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, they can then refile a gerrymandering suit, and now all of a sudden d determine gerrymandering to be illegal, which will then change the composition of the legislature there as well, and that, that thing go goes to state after state after state. And so it's a multi-pronged strategy when we talk about the courts. We have to get our folks centered on this to realize if that state court is the federal court, they're doing what they're doing, but if that state court, uh, if we're able to control some of those, you can also change the political dynamics that are happening where you live. I think I'm all about giving people some hope, Mr. King, so I want to I wanna find some hope here uh, on oh, the that, next part oh, of our that's conversation. Hope. I, that I think that's over. hopeful. That's hope. I think it's hopeful, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm giving hope. I'm people saying gotta have take a strategy. it over. But let's talk about this. I mean, the reality is, um, with the Dobbs decision that essentially overturned Roe v. Wade and sent the issue back to the states, and I think it's safe to say about half the states in America today, abortion is illegal or near illegal, very hard to access. Um, so it's really a choose your own adventure, depending on where you live. The people have responded to that. And I'm, I'm originally from uh, Nebraska, and I, I, I saw a lot of people on TV. Mm -hmm. I saw and I still see a lot of people on TV talking about, well, you know, Democrats, they got that done in Kansas. Ain't enough Democrats in the entire state of Kansas. White women defeat, woke the hell up. Yes. That's to, what happened. To defeat that ballot initiative. So there is, I think, an opportunity here where people are paying attention. Now, it's after the fact. But I'm, I'm somebody that is, I'm glad people have just come to the party. I don't care necessarily what time you got there. So to run it talk about, our, let's, <laughs> let's talk about, talk about the, the opportunity that we have now that people are, we're having a mainstream conversation about our rights in connection with the courts and everybody from the, the very smart political people in this room are feeling it, but also folks in everyday places and spaces in towns and cities across our country. Well, first of all, let, let, let me say one thing about what we haven't ingested enough of us yet. We went to the courts, the federal courts, for relief. And every time there was an expansion, this is the first time in this history, in modern history, certainly in my life, where the court decided to roll something back. And the, the frightening proposition is you know, Judge uh, Justice Thomas told us that they're coming after a lot of things. It's interesting that he picked things like, you know, marriage equality. He didn't. Pick he picked everything but interracial like, marriage. Let's be very clear. Uh, exactly. I thought you that wouldn't have a job without that. <laughs> Bet not touch my Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the real affirmative action. <laughs> so, so my you high school. my show called Unfiltered. <laughs> I'm going to get a call. Like Jose, unbought and unbought. You know Jose I Williams? Got, I ain't got a boss. I won't get a call. That's what I said. <laughs> uh, but I, I think this is a very pivotal moment in the history of our nation. You've got other people talking about a new civil war. It's very frightening that that is being said and nobody is willing to take it on and say, this is unconscionable, and this is not the America that any of us should accept. And there are some people crazy enough to do that. They showed us that on January 6th. So we all have to wake up. Now, I think it's interesting. I'm not, I'm going to get back around to what you said. It's, true. it's interesting that we call wokeness. There's something wrong with being awoke. Well, what's the opposite of being awoke? Sleep. My father did a sermon called Sleeping Through a Revolution many, many years ago, and yet encouraged us to always stay awoke. They've created, created uh, CRT. I don't even like to use the word. First of all, it doesn't even exist in primary, primary, secondary primary and secondary education. It's for law school. That's what it was designed for. That's where it was. They may have elements of what they call critical race theory. I mean, who's ever heard of something? Rolling State, Texas, I believe, used the I have a dream speech, the part of a speech about my four little children living in a nation where they're not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. They used that 
to dismantle and say, now you can't teach I Have a Dream. You can't teach in Texas. You can't teach Rosa Parks and, and a whole lot of other things about our, our, our Jewish community. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And we're sitting around accepting this as if this is all right. We can change things tomorrow, I believe, if we all decide we're going to get engaged. Y'all, you know, I, I mean, one example. How much money do we spend, how much money do we put in banks that don't support us? I don't want to call any names. Several of the big banks have put more black folk out of houses. It's a shame. Wells Fargo. Foreclosed. Bank America, too. Not just Wells Fargo. Bank America, all of them. And yet we just keep going down there supporting them, and we don't support ourselves. So my point is, we need to target one of these institutions and just say, look, we're not going to deal with y'all no more. They will come and help us address every issue we want to address. But we don't know that. We spent over a trillion, a trillion five hundred million dollars last year. A trillion. I mean, I what can't did y'all spend it on? Yeah, that's. that's but, 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 is this where is this where I, I get to? I think Ellie wants to jump in here, then I'll circle back to you. Yeah, so this is where I get to to yell about the mainstream media and you put on earmuffs and you know, right because <laughs> because that's a huge part of the problem too. Mm -hmm. I mean, like like to, to be honest. If you think about it, there are two ways that I like to think about this. One, think about how many reporters and people and whatever are, co are covering Congress. Think about how many reporters and people and whatever are covering the White House. And then think about how many reporters and people and whatever are covering the courts, which is just as powerful as the other three branches. Number one, right? So like, first of all, you've got a huge imbalance. We don't even have the coverage of these nine autocrats who are actually running things and have a veto power over the elected branches. That's number one problem. Number two, how many of those people covering the courts are black besides me? That you know of, right? Me, Kimberly Atkins, they're, they're like five of us. We have jackets, right? But like, for the most part, the people who were allowed to cover the courts are, are, are covering it from a fundamentally white basis of understanding because the, the very few people that are allowed to do this work um, are predominantly white. Number three, when you think about financial news, like if you think about CNBC or whatever, you got Jim Cramer, he's over there talking about the stocks that are going up in the day. They don't let people come on TV to talk about what's happening in the stock market who can't balance a checkbook. But they will absolutely put people on TV to tell you what the courts are really doing who don't have a law degree, who have never listened mm -hmm. to any of these, who have no idea really what they're talking about. I don't even know what the inside of the Supreme Court looked like. Right? And what they're then doing then is all they're doing is giving you the press release of what John Roberts or Clarence Thomas or whatever mm -hmm. wants them to say about their decision. So a huge part of the problem is the lack of transparency that happens with the court itself. We don't tell our people what's happening in this branch of government that is controlling so much of our lives. So I'm gonna give Roland, you, I'm gonna you give, I'm and gonna, then I'm gonna go to everyone for their final thought. So I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you this uh, because to understand why you also don't see many of us. Uh, and uh, Congressman Johnson has been uh, very aggressive in dealing with this year. We had a conversation. It started with a with a frat battle in Tulsa last year, and then when I began to talk about uh, the lack of dollars that Black-owned media receives. Uh, when you talked about who covers White House, who covers Congress, who covers Supreme Court, uh, when the CBC comes out of their meeting, there's not a single uh, black-owned media outlet with a congressional correspondent. Why is that the case? Because the ad industry spends $322 billion annually, black-owned me media gets 0.5%. Federal government spends a billion dollars on advertising a year, black-owned media gets 51 million of the one billion. And so the reality is you can't afford to actually pay somebody to be to cut for one of those jobs. And so he's been working to shake those dollars loose. Uh, and the reality is, and I've told Congress, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty this, I said if black on I said if I got five if I got five percent of five percent, I said I could easily hire three congressional correspondents in ninety days. It comes down to dollars. And so it is a deliberate attempt to keep the audience informed. It is, it is a deliberate attempt. These executives are making deliberate decisions uh, as to who is covering what. And so earlier when I was talking about all these issues that we have, 
you have to be able to educate folks, walk them through, and begin to lay out exactly what's going on. King said in his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he called on the Negro press to maintain its militant, militancy and focus on the substantive as opposed to uh, the nonsensical. We are caught up in the nonsensical where we spend more time on gossip stuff as opposed to actually substantive stuff. And so when it comes to the marching orders, what it requires us, and I'm going back to, I keep using that phrase, connect the dots, we have to walk folk through someone who says, man, none of this stuff means nothing to me. Them, folk, them folks in them black robes uh, don't impact me at all. And then you begin to say, really, are you, are you a felon or not? Uh, or do you have, st you, you take whatever issue they're dealing with, and I guarantee you, you can trace it right back to the Supreme Court. That's the work that we actually have to do. We have to stop saying the courts matter. We have to explain to somebody how the courts matter, why the courts matter. So the work is on us to break someone down to say, no, 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 let me walk you through this way, this way, this way. And I can guarantee you, because they have them on my show every single day, they go, oh my God, mm -hmm. I had no idea that they are involved in precisely. And so that must be our charge walking out of here. Stop hoping, well, Congressman Jones, Congressman Johnson, the reality is this here. Every single person sitting here, you are communicating with somebody and groups of people on a daily basis. Now I have to challenge you. What are y'all talking about when y'all communicating? All right, now that's a way to kick it off. All right, Tamara, I want you to kick, well, Roland kicked us off. I want you to pick, pick up where he left off. Final thoughts here. This is a battle that is actively being waged. Roland mentioned student loans. A number of Republican states' attorney generals have gotten together to challenge the Biden administration's most recent policy in the courts on student loan uh, forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness. So final thoughts here. I, I to pick up where Brother Roland left it off is that yes, as individuals, we have to talk about the courts and why they matter and connect the dots. Our organizations need to as well. We are part of communities. We are part of institutions that, that have cases in front of this court coming up. And those organizations do not have a position on this issue or their issue or their position is we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to continue to throw our money and our resources going in front of this court. We're going to allow Clarence Thomas to be the ideological anchor of this court to determine what the future is of our organization's future. Like, I believe in abortion. But if organizations that protect and defend abortion do not say that this court is broken, the people who follow that organization are going to think, well, I guess the court's fine. I guess this is how it's supposed to be. And we know that that's not true. So the same way that you talk to your neighbors about why this court matters, why the Supreme Court said last year that you really don't have Miranda rights anymore and what that means for you, the organizations that are supposed to protect our rights, Miranda rights and so forth, have to also say, well, this court is broken and it's no longer fair for us. This is not a level playing field for our communities. And we have to take a position. We can't be scared because we go in front of that court. I've never been inside the Supreme Court, right? But I really hope that the people who go in front of that court recognize that this isn't fair. Why do you want to keep going in front of a court and you keep losing? Do you want to keep losing? How much more do we want to lose? You have to use the court as a strategy. This is a strategy for us. It's a tactic. Adding seats is a tactic for the broader strategy to protect and defend our democracy. And our organizations have to believe that too. All right. Thank you, Tamara. Mr. Donald. So to build off of that, I think we need to do two things. One, we do need to convey why the court matters, but then we immediately need to say, but these people aren't special, right? You know, they think, and many of us think, and many in Congress think that these judges are above the law, that they are beyond reproach, that they can sit up on high and determine our civil rights, determine our access to health care, and don't have to be accountable to us don't have to be accountable to anybody, don't have to be accountable to Congress. That's what Chairman Johnson's bill has been about. That's what his effort to hold the court accountable has been a part. Yes, these justices matter. Yes, this institution matters. But if it matters, it also has to be accountable. These folks ain't special, 
as my mom likes to say, and we need to remind them and we need to change our laws so that they can be held accountable and push them. Look, we have given you life tenure and the authority to determine whether we have access to health care, whether we can vote, and you're telling me you can't even abide by basic ethical rules that you know low-level government employees need to abide by? It's laughable. So we need to do both of those things. All right. Thank you, Donald. Mr. Martin Luther King III. I want to say two things very um, quickly. My dad used to say that there's nothing more powerful in all the world than an idea whose time has come. And secondly, that the time is always right to do that which is right. Now is the time for us to transform this court so that it works for the majority of the population of the United States of America. We can either sit by in our seats and do nothing, or we can do many of the things that Roland and everyone up here has stated. And we need to do it now. So now is the time. Now is the time. And our justice correspondent will have the last word on this. I want to take us back to where this panel started, Supreme Shift, the shift to Clarence Thomas. Let's go back to 1988, Thurgood Marshall, my favorite justice, the most favorite, favorite justice of a lot of people in this room. He's sick. He was appointed in 1967. He's a 78-year-old man. He is sick. He underst he's just hung on through two administrations of Ronald Reagan. Now George Bush is in charge, and George Bush has whooped Michael Dukakis. because it doesn't look like um, a Democrat is going to be uh, in power in his lifetime, and he is old and sick and can't do the job anymore at the high level that he had come to expect for himself and, he had come to, and the country expected of him. So in an amazing act of putting country first, Thurgood Marshall hands in his resignation letter to George H.W. Bush, knowing full well that they would replace him with a person who wasn't up to his level. But that's what he did for the country. But he didn't die in 1988. Thurgood Marshall died in January 1993, two weeks after Bill Clinton was inaugurated president. Never let them tell you that the justices they have on the court now are legitimate. Never let them tell you that. And always fight for the ideals that a Thurgood Marshall had and not the lesser people that have come to take his place. Give it up for this panel. I am told, you know, Roland made a point about the line down the hall. I'm told, Roland, there's how many people on this no, watching right. online? So, so the, the, reason, uh, the, the, the reason why owning your stuff matters, uh, and a lot of so y'all come up to me, say you're supporters of our show and our network. Uh, we are live streaming this, so we don't just talk to the room. Uh, and so the reality is there are more than a thousand folks who have been watching our panel. Right. And uh, we restream this at least eight more times. That's how we also use black owned media to drive message and go outside of the room. Uh, and so that's why what Congressman is doing is important. That's why when I'm back there selling copies of this book, White Fear, that's paying for that. And again, as I said, the hierarchy of my company is God than me. I ain't got to ask nobody what to do. <laughs> well, I am very happy for my boss. And with that, I would like to give another round of applause for this panel, but an even larger round of applause for the chairman and Congressman Jones. Y'all can do better than that. Stand up, my dear, for pioneering this conversation, keeping the conversation going. We thank you, sir. We thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's give it up for Simone Sanders, y'all. It took a hell of a woman to moderate this panel right here. So I want to thank the panelists. I, I also want to thank Roland Martin for giving me my free copy. Oh, trust uh, me, that ain't free. Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> white fear. I'm going to enjoy reading this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in 1971, which was just Six years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 
and eight years after the passage in 64 of the Civil Rights Act. There was a future Supreme Court Justice. His name was Lewis Powell, and he at that time was a corporate lawyer out of Richmond, Virginia, representing wealthy corporations, and he wrote what is now referred to as the Lewis Powell Memo or Memorandum. And if you go and Google that, which he published in 1971 or which he wrote in 1971 to his friends in the United States Chamber of Commerce, he laid out a framework for the takeover of this country to, to stop what had been started by passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And after his memo was sent, he was then appointed to the United States Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, who gained his election by promising law and order. And we know those code words. We know what that means. And so Lewis Powell was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And as a result of all of the things that he recommended in his memo, we are at this point in our history as a people. And Republicans have taken the United States Supreme Court and the federal judiciary very seriously, but we have not. The Democrats have not. They've been focused on it for 50 years, and they finally got what they wanted. And now we are paying the price for it. And so that's what this panel was all about. I hope that it has activated you, something that you may have heard from one of these illustrious speakers. I hope you, something has activated you to be more involved in this issue. And um, Simone Sanders, y'all got to watch her show. Congratulations on you getting your show. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mondaire Jones to close us out. Y'all give another hand to the panel and the moderator and to the distinguished chair of the subcommittee on courts whose leadership has been instrumental in getting us to this point. Uh, and yet we know from the discussion today that we have yet further to go. And that is going to require everyone in this room having those conversations that Roland mentioned with people in their circle. I mean, this should be top of mind for folks as we witness the cascade of horrors that we're going to see from the Supreme Court until we do something to stop it. And I thank God every day that we are not powerless to stop this from continuing to happen. But that takes leadership not just in Congress, where unfortunately too many of my colleagues have lived such conservative, risk-averse lives that they find themselves often behind where the American people are on any number of subjects. Just look at how few of my Democratic colleagues have signed on to uh, legislation that Hank Johnson and I have introduced to add four seats to the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, that is why your movement building is so important. Uh, it's why we need you to elevate today's discussion. It's why we need you to educate people about what is at stake uh, with the Supreme Court uh, and with other fundamental rights that black people in particular urgently need to see protected and in some instances restored. We know that with abortion, for example, black women bear the brunt of that crisis that has been made worse now with it being ended as a floor as a floor. Roe v. Wade was a floor. We already had issues, even with Roe v. Wade, with accessing necessary reproductive care. Um, so I'm grateful to be here in community with all of you uh, and just understand the power that you have. The folks who we do have in Congress supporting this, many of them signed on because their constituents brought this to them and intimated to them that there would be consequences potentially for them not being supportive of the only thing that would actually save us in this moment. Um, so thanks again for everything. Thanks again to the panel, to our moderator. Um, and let's keep fighting. Let's get y'all on stage. Can I get a group picture? Yeah. You want to just stay seated? You want no, to stay